earlier, he had sent a message to Estina telling her that she would not make it through her pregnancy. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, please do subscribe. And if you're old here, hello again. My name's Kate Philpot. I was gonna say this is Sandy, but uh, Sandy's not here right now. She's on a walk. <laughs> She's got a very busy schedule. <laughs> And I've got a very special video for you today. So it's special for two reasons. The first reason being, this case was requested to me by a close friend of the victim. And honestly, I am so grateful and honestly honored that this person trusts me enough to cover their friend's case and share the story with my little portion of the internet. And to that person, I'm just gonna say thank you so much for reaching out and your friend is so proud of you for, for doing that and sharing her story. And this is a very important story for the world to hear. And on that note, I wanna share with you the second reason this is a special video. And that is, I wanna tell you real quick about the Lauren McCluskey Foundation. So I came across a lovely girl on Instagram called Marina. Hi Marina, if you're watching this, you're probably like, oh God, hello. And she had one of these stickers on one of her posts on Instagram. So the sticker says, I made Lauren's promise. I will listen and believe you if someone is threatening you. And just a little background on the foundation and stuff. Lauren McCluskey, a 21 year old honor student athlete was murdered on October 22nd, 2018 on the University of Utah campus by a man she briefly dated. We must all take actions to ensure that this never happens again. If you're in immediate danger, call the emergency services. If you're experiencing sexual assault, domestic violence, and or stalking, please report it to me. I'm guessing the me is Linda Middlehammer who signed this letter. And I can connect you to resources, including police and victims advocates, who help survivors determine their own needs in regards to their physical and emotional health, reporting options, and other concerns. So this is quite topical, and without giving any spoilers, if you will, the case that I'm about to cover shows you just how bad domestic abuse can get. So while it's fresh on our minds, I just wanna let you know that A, I made Lauren's promise, and if by, some chance there's someone that needs to know that. And B, to let you know that you can get your own Lauren's Promise sticker for free. They don't even charge you for shipping. This was sent to me from the US. I'm in Ireland. I didn't even have to put in my card details. So if you also wanna you know, put yourself out there as an ally and as someone that people can trust, you can get yourself a sticker and you can also donate to the foundation. So I'll have all the details linked below for that. So I just thought that this was so important and so topical because this arrived for me while I was researching for this case. So it just made sense for me to talk about it and I suppose give a real life example of just how bad domestic abuse can get and also provide a resource that can help people. Maybe because I've mentioned it, a life will be saved. I know that's wishful thinking, but you have to kind of think about it like that. So I hope that all made sense, but other than that, Let's get into this video. So this is the case of Estina Blunny. Estina Blunny was a 20 year old girl from Harlow in Essex. She loved to cook and she was actually studying catering in a local college. She was a family girl, a loyal friend, and she tried her best at everything she did, you know? She was described by her friends as quite fiery, but also quirky, bubbly, and was always up for an adventure or even just to have a couple of drinks and have a laugh. Estina loved to be outside. She loved going for walks or even just to sit in the park or something like that. And and she was pretty popular. She knew a lot of people and she just seemed to touch a lot of lives. Unfortunately, in 2009, Estina suffered the loss of a close friend of hers called Jordan and this affected her quite badly. However, she was an incredibly strong woman and she did manage to just trudge on. In April of 2011, she got into a relationship with this guy and things did move quite fast because only three months later, they were engaged. And pretty soon after that, it came out that Asina was pregnant. However, a few months later, they did actually split up. So she was just going through this pregnancy as a single woman. And she was really looking forward to becoming a mother and her due date was on the 30th of June, 2012. Her father, Kevin, said initially he was disappointed that she was pregnant because she was so young and like, you know, the relationship wasn't really where it should have been and all this kind of stuff. But in the months leading up to her due date, she really was just 
putting in a lot of effort, just becoming a better person for this baby and just improving herself in pretty much every way. And she really seemed to get her life back together, if you will. Okay, now I'm gonna fast forward to the 27th of June, 2012. Essex police were contacted just before 3 a.m. with reports of a woman found near a busy main road. This woman was lying in a pool of blood with severe head and facial injuries. Bits of her hair that were matted with blood were found around her body and this person who reported this believed that she had been run over. And this woman was in fact Estina Blunny, who was only three days away from her due date. She was taken to hospital and soon after that, she was pronounced dead. And to make matters even worse, her unborn daughter, who she had decided to call Mia Rose, had died as well. So a post-mortem or autopsy was carried out, of course. And it was found that Estina had suffered a severe brain injury due to repeated blows to the head. She suffered more than 50 separate injuries with most of the bruising around her face. And Mia Rose, her unborn daughter, had died due to starvation of vital oxygen as a result of these injuries. So following this post-mortem, the police opened a murder investigation because th <laughs> this doesn't just happen. It's not like it was just a fatal fall or anything and she had over 50 injuries that would not make any sense whatsoever. The police actually believed that she had been beaten to death. So straight off the bat, it was like, okay, who would do such a disgusting thing to anyone, let alone someone who is heavily pregnant? Was this a random attack or did she know the attacker? Or like, what were the situations surrounding this attack? Because just did not make any sense. But pretty much straight away, the police arrested a 23 year old man who was also from Harlow on suspicion of Estina's murder and child destruction. So the police sealed off the area so that they could fully investigate and they also searched a home in the area in connection with the deaths. But hold up a sec because who was this man? Well, in order to answer that question, I have to delve into Estina's relationship history. So obviously Estina had been pregnant and she had been in a pretty serious relationship with a guy called Tony McLernan in the year leading up to her murder. It was his baby, of course, as well. This guy, Tony, had also grown up locally and he had a younger brother called Terry as well. And like I said, Estina and Tony got into a relationship in April of 2011 and only three months later they were engaged. So it was a bit of a whirlwind of a relationship. It was pretty intense pretty quickly, but things weren't exactly ideal to say the least. Within a month of Estina getting into this relationship, she stopped seeing her friends and family. And when she did see her family, they noticed some bruising on her arms. And within this bruising, they noticed the outline of knuckles. Estina was also said to have worsening personal hygiene around this time and dramatic weight loss as well. And they did have a bit of an on again, off again type relationship, but Estina really lost contact with a lot of friends and a lot of family as well and just kind of went off the grid for a while. So there were several telltale signs of an abusive relationship going on here, but that's not all. Tony, as well as his brother Terry, were said to have significant anger issues from quite a young age. As young an age as primary school age, which is what, like four years old to 12 years old, like somewhere in between there. And Terry, the younger brother, had pretty aggressive behavior in the playground. And I don't wanna give the exact example that was provided to me for the safety and the anonymity of the person involved, but you could say, yes, there's play fighting as kids and stuff like that, but Terry would carry out these behaviors with venom almost, like he was intending to harm other people. And we're still talking primary school age, so you know, bit wild. And okay, I know that's not directly Tony, but if this is something that Tony grew up around, I mean, we all know that the type of people you're around during your childhood has a massive impact on who you become in later life. And if Tony was around these kind of behaviors, then it was pretty likely that maybe he'd be able to do similar things or potentially even worse things. 
Moving on to Tony's relationship history. In 2004, when Tony was only 15 years of age, he was in a relationship with a girl called Kimberly. The relationship lasted about two years, but over the course of these two years, uh, Tony did some stuff. He would undermine this girl's self-confidence and self-esteem. He stopped her from seeing her friends to the point where she almost fully stopped going to school. He threatened her with knives, he punched her, and he would tread on her head. <sighs> All between the ages of 15 and 17. Mm. He also broke her jaw and he even hit her inside of a police station and made her head bounce off the like the glass part or a pl hard plastic part, something like that. Moving on, in October of 2007, Tony got into a different relationship with a girl called Jessica. During the course of this relationship, he also threatened her with knives. He would order her to her knees and press the knife against her stomach, telling her that if she moved an inch, that he would stab her. One woman also reported him grabbing her by the neck and threatening her in front of people in the park. And a few years before his relationship with Estina, he was also in another relationship with another local girl that I'm just gonna put a name on because I don't have a name, but um, let's just call her Jane for the purpose of storytelling. And while he was on holiday with Jane, he threw a vase at her head. Now, luckily, he did miss, but like that alone, it says a lot about him as a person. Whether he just enjoyed being that aggressive and in control, or he genuinely could not control his rage and his anger, I'm not altogether sure, or maybe it was a mixture of both. But either way, it's a very toxic situation, and he's a very toxic person. But of course, I'm guessing that a lot of these girls probably didn't speak out about it at the time because you would be fing terrified of him doing something if it got out, you know? Also, while in this relationship with Jane, he made her call a friend and he was telling her what to say. Like this person could hear him telling her what to say and she would repeat it. And he basically talked her through ending this friendship with her which again says a lot about him. It's very controlling and manipulative and just insanely toxic. Another person reported him painting, I don't exactly wanna say the words, but insults on walls near her home. And then he threatened her on her doorstep. Okay, so fast forward to when he was with Estina. So it was in October of 2011 when Estina told him that she was pregnant with his baby. And at one point they actually had an argument where Tony shouted at her saying, the child is not mine, I could do better than you. So there are just so many examples of him being controlling, manipulative, bullying these women. And despite breaking up a few months before the baby was due. The thing is, although this was beneficial for Estina's physical and mental health, she was still pregnant with his baby and therefore they would be tied together for life. And considering how abusive he was, that was incredibly concerning. And you guessed it, this was the guy that they arrested for the murder of Estina Blunny. But still, why? Okay, abusive is one thing, and I don't mean to undermine that in any way, but there's a difference between abuse and full-blown murder. Okay, I'm gonna just fast forward a little, little bit more to 2013, and this is when the trial took place. And of course, Tony pleaded not guilty, but <laughs> this is when, like, so much information came out about the lead up to Estina's death. So like I said, Tony pleaded not guilty and his narrative of what went down that night was he witnessed two men jumping on Estina and stamping on her head and all this stuff and he couldn't do anything about it for some reason, right? So that's the story he's going by. 
But let's get to the evidence. In April of 2012, only two months before Astina's death, Tony strangled Astina with such force that she thought she was gonna die along with her baby. Can we just put our minds into that moment for a second? How traumatic would that be? This alone would have you totally fearing for your life and would probably be traumatic enough to have serious physical or mental consequences from it. But moving on, a series of text messages were sent from Tony to several family members and friends in the time leading up to Estina's death. So around this time, Estina had been trying to get in contact with Tony's new girlfriend and Honestly, I'm not altogether sure what the nature of this contact was, if she was trying to warn her off Tony, or if she was I'm jealous, I, I honestly don't know. Maybe she was even just saying, look, by the way, you know, the guy that you're with is about to become a father, because that's a pretty big life event too. <laughs> but regardless of what the content of these messages were, Tony, <sighs> He had sent some worrying texts. In May of 2012, Tony texted a friend saying, I want someone to just kick the out of her and leave me alone. Earlier, he had sent a message to Estina telling her that she would not make it through her pregnancy. In another text on the 23rd of June, only four days before Estina's murder, Tony sent a text to another friend saying, I effing swear, bro, I'm going to knife Estina soon. She's proper ruining my relationship. And in another message, he said, I'm sure I'm going to prison Monday. My ex is proper trying to ruin my relationship with my new girl. So <laughs> this is all pretty incriminating stuff in itself because it's showing serious evidence of premeditation. And then the kicker. On the night of the 26th of June, Tony and Estina exchanged several text messages. And according to these texts, Tony had actually lured Estina to go meet him that night, with one of his texts saying, I've got a surprise for you, hope you like it. And you're probably thinking, well, why did she go and meet this guy who she knew was abusive in the middle of the night and all this stuff? Well, yeah, she had been initially reluctant to go meet him, but you have to remember, this guy wasn't just abusive, he was controlling, he was manipulative. And he convinced her to go meet him with his self-pitying messages that would basically make Estina feel sorry for him. And that's what made her go to him. And I'm sure there was a level of fear in Estina in that if she refused to go, she was probably afraid of what he would do. Do you know what I mean? It's just... <laughs> This is why foundations like the Laura McCluskey Foundation are so incredibly important. Like it might sound so easy to some people to be like, just report them to the police or, you know, just get out of the relationship. Like it's not that easy at all. And also remember like at this point, Estina and Tony weren't even in a relationship. But anyway, to the worst part of this video, when they met up that night, Tony, who was fueled by alcohol and cannabis, forced her to the ground and kicked her and stamped on her repeatedly, knowing that he was causing significant harm to not just her, but also their unborn baby. And Estina's harrowing screams and the impact of the blows could be heard from a lot of the nearby homes. And what these people could hear revealed the intensity and the duration of the attack. And it did go on for quite a bit of time. Although I don't know the exact duration of the attack, what I do know is for some time, Estina was well aware of what was happening and she knew that significant damage was being done to both her and her baby and that there was a chance that neither of them would make it. So it wasn't like a quick and easy death for her. And Estina was actually captured on CCTV moments before her death, walking along the street. And soon after, Tony was shown on CCTV walking the other direction. This next part, I just, 
After the killings, Tony went and hid in a nearby forest and texted his dad saying, Scared, please call me. What? <laughs> a coward. <laughs> like, oh no, poor you. And later on he spoke to his father on the phone and said, I think I've killed Estina. And in court, Tony did give evidence that he was addicted to cheap supermarket alcohol, particularly strong cider mixed with Lambrini sparkling wine. Anyway, then it came to the verdict. After only two hours of deliberation, the jury found Tony McLernan guilty on both charges of murder and child destruction. And at the age of 24, Tony was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 27 years. But I mean, I can't really see him getting out because <laughs> I mean, look at that history. The guy is the personification of evil. And uh, on that note, to this day, Tony shows no sign of remorse and he denies murdering Asina and her baby. And he's still sticking to that story that two men did it. I mean, like, I normally try to play devil's advocate and you know, ask questions like, do you think this person really did it? But I, th this is just undeniable, like. <laughs> and Estina's family said that they were pleased the jury saw through his lies and saw him as the evil person he truly was. And they also said, Estina was a wonderful and loving daughter looking forward to the birth of her first child. Sadly, this will no longer be. This shouldn't have happened. And I will get into more on why it shouldn't happen in a second, but can we just take a moment for the fact that she was only 20 years old and her baby was about to be born? The baby would be eight now and she would be 28. So in November of 2015, an inquest opened up into the murder of Estina Blunny. And this was requested by the family due to some unanswered questions. It was thought that a lawyer made the wrong decision not to charge Tony for that assault, the strangling assault, two months before Estina's murder. And when I came across this information, I, was, I, I didn't actually realize that it had been reported. So Estina went through this traumatic thing, reported it to the authorities, and a lawyer didn't charge him for assault. So if this lawyer did charge him, okay, maybe Tony wouldn't have gotten a life sentence or, you know, but it is very possible that Estina Blunny and her baby Mia Rose would still be alive today. At the time, there was a police file that branded Estina as medium risk of domestic violence and it also said that he had serious potential to harm Estina. This was on the file and he got no punishment and nothing was done to protect her. But just on this note though, and I, I'm trying to play devil's advocate here, although people were aware that he had abusive tendencies, nobody really thought that he was quite capable of the brutality of the murders that he carried out. Because bear in mind as well, while Estena and Tony were together, he had forced her to make excuses for, you know, the bruising and all the little things that people were noticing. So although it's easy for me to say something should have been done earlier, at least from the friends and family's perspective, it was still a massive shock. People likely knew that there was some level of abuse going on, but they possibly didn't realize quite the extent of it. But that said, the authorities did know about it and they still didn't do anything to protect her. So, and that brings me to the end of this case. Again, I just wanna say thank you so, so much to the person that asked me to do this case. I am honestly so grateful that you trusted me to cover it. And on another note, with everything I've said about domestic abuse and violence, don't forget to go on to the website. I'll have it linked in the description below and pick up a sticker if you wanna make Lauren's promise uh, or you can donate to the foundation as well. I just think that it is something that goes on that a lot of people don't know about or maybe turn a blind eye to, I don't know. But particularly in 2020 with a lot of people being 
in quarantine, on lockdown, stay at home orders, because that is still going on. There are people who are stuck at home with their abusers and told that that's the safe thing to do, when in reality... <laughs> so if I can offer up the information on the Laura McCluskey Foundation, I'm sure you probably know a lot more foundations and organizations that deal with this kind of issue. By all means, put them in the comments below. There's no too much help with this kind of thing. So thank you for watching this video. If you did enjoy it, please leave a like and comment down below. Let me know what your thoughts are on it. My Instagram and Twitter are katephilpot underscore yt. And that is all I've got to say. So thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye.